Today I'm fixating on a very specific non-abortion part of the recent Texas abortion decision. Civil procedure. That's right, I know where the clicks are. Now there's some monumental shifts to this country's legal structures going on just below the surface on this issue. Let me start by asking you guys a simple question. Have you ever seen Judge Judy sentence someone to prison? No, because her TV show deals with civil cases, not criminal ones. You know, in a criminal case, the federales are going after you for breaking the law. You can't do that because Congress wrote it down on this year piece of paper. Now, this can span from crimes that hurt other people, like murder, to crimes that just hurt the criminal, like substance abuse. In a civil case, on the other hand, one civilian sues another civilian to recoup some sort of damages. Take for example, if you think someone said something about you that's libelous, well, lawyer up and sue them for damages. Here's the rub today. In civil cases, only an injured party has standing to sue someone else. I can't become an expert in zoning laws and suddenly sue some random guy in Ohio for building his fence one foot over onto someone else's property. That would just be weird. Uh, who are you? Oh, oh you want to get paid because I should have a little more property? Huh, I, I, I guess we're on the same team. Now into this new Texas law that pushes the standing question into uncharted territories. Remember, this is not Walker Texas Ranger going after you for breaking the law. This is some guy going after you for damages. Typically in tort law, which is used to compensate people who have been injured, a person must have incurred some sort of personal harm in order to sue someone else. That's the very nature of what a civil court is intended to remedy in such a case. Not today though. Texas has officially turned every American citizen into a potential ambulance chaser. Now under this new Texas law, anyone can sue anyone who performs aids or intends to aid in an abortion, regardless of whether they have a personal stake in the abortion performed. Heck, I could sue to collect damages from a person I've never met getting an abortion in Texas. Houston, we might have a problem. So that's weird. How would that even work? Well, I'd like to pivot back into the uncharted territory comment from earlier. We're really not sure. Texas Right to Life Legislative Director John Sego laid out his theory for how these civil cases will proceed very succinctly. They have standing because the legislature gives it to them. You don't have to be personally harmed. Were you affected by this? No. Okay, well, do you have a permission slip to sue this person? Alright, we're a go. Now to give you an idea of just how unprecedented this precedent is, the closest law people are drawing parallels to right now are environmental laws. The Clean Air and Clean Water Acts allow citizens and environmental groups to sue the government for not properly enforcing environmental laws. But even then, they have to be filing lawsuits on behalf of someone who was directly affected by the environmental harm they're suing for. So okay, we've got this questionable new legal standard being approached. Now to the part where the rubber hits the road. Can Texas provide this carte blanche access to civil courts? Now the answer here depends on how expensive your lawyer is. The open question is whether standing is something that courts consider only to figure out who is allowed to sue under any given law, or if standing is something that is so essential to the nature of what a court is that it constrains the legislature. Now, To put that simply, is it an unspoken rule that civil cases need to reflect damages, or is it more of an unspoken suggestion that state legislatures can ignore to carve out occasional exceptions? Now the question of standing, or who is allowed to sue, will be taken up by the state courts. There are serious questions about whether the Texas Constitution requires someone to have standing to bring a lawsuit, or if indeed the legislature's protection will be enough to allow people to bring what lawyers call generalized grievances, or harms that weren't committed against them personally. Now this legal innovation is the main factor that differentiates today's abortion law from that of its predecessors, at least in terms of court success. 
You see, previous iterations of abortion laws have all been state bans, meaning that they would be decided in a criminal court. Think something that would be along the lines of Texas versus Planned Parenthood. Now, in those cases, you could point to that ban and say, look, the state is violating my civil rights. Planned Parenthood v Casey, the case that replaced Roe vs Wade as the precedent setting abortion case, explicitly says that states can't ban abortions for fetuses that are pre-viable. In this case though, well, it's not really the states that's enforcing the ban. They outsource that job to each and every one of us. Now, that small legal innovation has changed the core dynamics of this conversation, at least according to the current Supreme Court majority. In their recent shadow docket decision to not invalidate the Texas abortion law while lower courts review whether it's actually constitutional or not, the Supreme Court used some truly ironic logic. They essentially ruled that the pro-choice lobby lacked standing because they hadn't yet been injured. Nobody's sued someone seeking an abortion yet, so no one's been injured, so therefore you can't bring a civil suit. I mean, could you imagine if people could willy nilly sue something that didn't affect them just because they didn't like it? Can't have that happening. Now, some of you, of course, might be scratching your heads and saying, wait, 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 back up for a second. So, Texas passes a law that says anyone, whether they've been damaged or not, can bring a civil suit against someone. But the Supreme Court says that you can't challenge that because nobody has used it to sue someone yet, and therefore no one has experienced damages that can be recouped. To which I say, yes. The court observed it wasn't clear whether the defendants can or will seek to enforce the Texas law against the providers in a way that could allow the court to get involved in the dispute at this stage. So they didn't get involved. Now, according to this logic, you would have to wait until someone actually sues you for violating the ban, as opposed to challenging the constitutionality of the ban itself. And now, for those of you at home trying to play a fun little game of spot the difference, don't worry, you're not alone. So, if under current legal precedent you can't ban pre viability abortions, and Texas just opened the legal floodgates for civil lawsuits that would essentially ban pre viability abortions, isn't that unconstitutional? Well, the three progressive judges would 100% agree with you. The person who seemed most on the fence about this issue was Chief Justice John Roberts, who voted with the progressives to take down the law while the courts figure out its actual constitutionality. He wrote in his decision that by deputizing private citizens to enforce the law, the law insulates the state from responsibility. Because of the novelty and significance of the question though, he would stop the law from going into effect to preserve the status quo and allow lower courts to decide whether a state can avoid responsibility for its laws in such a manner. So at this point, the Texas law is going to be returned to lower courts to address some of the core civil law questions that I mentioned earlier in this episode. First, can a state shield itself from legal responsibility by delegating enforcement of laws to private citizens? And second, can a private citizen file a civil suit when they have no relation to the case at hand? What we did actually find out this week was that the law will stand while the courts answer those bigger questions. Now, before I go, this is not a one off civil court question. These permission slips from state legislatures subverting all sorts of Supreme Court precedent are starting to pop up across the country. John Michaels, a professor at UCLA Law, points to Tennessee, where students, teachers, and employees of public schools can sue schools if they share a bathroom with a transgendered person, as well as Florida, where student athletes can sue their school if it allows a transgendered athlete to play. Now, before you would have to articulate a specific damage to have the court remedy in order to have these cases heard, which is possible, but it might be a little difficult. Now, on the other hand, you can just show the judge your state congressional permission slip and they'll hear the case. Now, because of these new laws, the ongoing court battle might be just a little peek over the precipice into a whole new world of third party social justice warrior tort lawsuits. 
Until next time, thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, now before I get to the begging for subscribers portion of the outro, I'd like to say that I think this video is probably pretty important, and I also think that most people probably aren't going to organically find it. So if you wouldn't mind sharing it out, well, I think that would be great. Now to the normal part, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked. Join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom continues to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.